Fourteen years ago, I did what thousands of my Australian generation did. I left. I left without ever really knowing my own country. I'd grown up in Sydney, in back streets and on beaches. I'd never seen a flood or a drought, and I'd never known the searing emptiness of the great Australian outback, the bush. As you'll probably know, Australia is a rich and very lucky country. And yet all I can remember was a growing feeling of isolation inside my own country, as if the world and Australia revolved on different axes. You see, Australia is both ordinary and very strange. Little more than the population of Greater London live in an area the size of the United States. And most of them are either indifferent to or secretly frightened of what lies beyond. And some of them have never really forgiven those pommy bastards for being so far away. This film is simply my impression of Australia after 14 years away. Is Australia really the lucky country, the classless land of the future? Or is it merely a minor branch office of London and Washington? Or perhaps, just perhaps, the greatest island on the earth is really something else. I would like this film to begin to answer those questions for you and me. The road to Alice Springs in the heart of Australia. I first made this trip eight years ago with an old friend called Charlie Perkins. Charlie was the first Aborigine to be accepted into an Australian university. And now we have come back to near where he was born, to this place called the Palms, a hideously mocking name for a shanty town which is little more than a benign concentration camp for those who are the real Australians. What, what about the health of the yeah. kids? Is that, has that improved at all? Oh, run over them. Come into this warm place. What's still, what, what's the problem? Still a chest and... Chest and, uh, you know, you know, yeah. and some of them yeah. get the trouble in. A lot of them have that dysentery yeah. and uh, diarrhea and things like that. But that's common everywhere, you know? And when you were here 10 years ago or 8 years ago, it's exactly the same now. It's exactly the same. It has, hasn't changed. It hasn't changed a bit. I remember that sewer over there and how it, was, how it used to overflow. It's exactly the same. You can smell it. That's right. Yeah, it stinks to high hell. And yeah. then the mos mosquito. Are you good luck? Oh, like a mosquito. And the kids get all the infections yeah. out of that. Mm -hmm. Do these kids get to school at all? Yeah. Do you get nurses and doctors coming by? And... A nurse, a sister coming every second day, man. Second days. Give them a jab. Give them a jab, yeah. Leave them here. Mm -hmm. Give them one needle and then they mm -hmm. say, you know, survive again until we come back and give you another needle, you know, to allow you to survive. And that's been going on for years. But these houses, I remember when I was a kid, these houses were here. And they're still here, the same house. And the government's come up here, Dr. Coombs come up here, all the ministers of Aboriginal Affairs come up here, and they're still the same. There were plenty of opportunity to put power in, and power's just here, 20 yards yeah. away. Yeah. And that's been there for 10 years, and they wouldn't put it on this place. The people here have asked for decent electricity, they've asked for better housing, they've asked for water, they've asked for sewerage, nothing. You know, nothing happened. Every yeah. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs in the Labour government and the Liberal government been here. Doesn't matter who's in. No, it doesn't matter who's in, they're all just as bad as each other. It never changes. Sydney Radio on 2GB. Premier, Premier, Premier Permanent Passport is a pocket full of dreams. Premier can do everything for you that giants can. Same interest, same protection. This is fantastic, 2UW. Putting the fun into summer. I spent most of my young life growing up around here in Bondi. I lived just up the hill and used to run down to Bondi Beach every morning. Sometimes I'm not quite sure why I left it. It's, uh, it was a life totally without complication and a happy life. And I suppose the thing that puzzles a lot of Australians like myself who do leave is, is why we left such a a complete physical paradise. All the things that all the brochures at Australia House used to say, most of them are true. You know, a lot of us who go abroad, and I include myself in this, make the mistake of, of criticising Australia for being something that it never has any pretension of being. 
It's a very arrogant expatriate view, and I've, I'm as guilty as anybody because I've written articles about Australia in which I've accused it of being something that it, it doesn't want to be. And, you know, Australia is a, is a working-class paradise, if you like. It's a, it's a place where people have come from England and Italy and Greece and all over the world where they, they can find the, the house and the garden and the, the job and uh, they have the same problems. They have to work in factories and uh, they can lose their jobs and their wives will have to work and so on. But at the weekend, a lot of that is forgotten. People do what they're doing here and that's Australia. I think for the first time in, in this trip back, and I've been away 14 years and I'm now back for I suppose the sixth or seventh time, I'm starting for the first time to come to terms with my own country and what it is and its limitations. Well, this afternoon, tonight and tomorrow, miles of warm and humid with sunny periods, some isolated showers, moderate south to southeast winds and seas becoming choppy in the afternoon. In Sydney it's 26 degrees. Brian Bury, CW News. Unlike America, Australia wasn't founded by idealists. After the convicts, a few brave men went into the outback, while everybody else went to the beach. I've always felt that Australians are so fanatical about sport and so good at it, because so many other dreams have failed. Our West was never really won, and the great cities like Sydney, hanging on the very edge of a largely unpioneered country, are confessions of that failure. No Thomas Jefferson ever lived here, Australian heroes have always been measured by how many Olympic gold medals they can win or how many pommy wickets they can smash. This lack of real heroes and of a national identity have always been a melancholy side to Australia, understood only by those who know us well. And it's this that some Australians are now trying to change. Unfortunately, the search for an Australian identity has been taken over by the all-pervasive Australian media, which has created a thing called the Ocker. On the surface, the ochre is simply the cousin of Alf Garnet and Andy Cap, a universal slob. But to the advertising industry, the ochre is the fair income child of nature, living in the shade of the poker machine in a pile of coldies. Now behold the native ochre. Hey, remember me, your old mate, buck off Uncle Bill. I'll give you a buck off the regular price of spirits when you buy me own Uncle Bill's brand of whiskey, brandy, gin, vodka and white rum. I used to give you a buck off the regular price of the two dozen pack of the Curry's coldies, and now I'm giving you two bucks off. But Uncle Bill, you get a buck off twice. Two bucks off the two dozen pack of the Curry's Draft, Tag and Crest or Colony Long. Mate, if you buy your spirits of beer from any other bottle shop, I reckon you've sold them ivory between the ears. Uncle Bill gives you a buck off the regular price of spirits when you buy my own brand of whiskey, brandy, gin, vodka and white rum. So duck off for your double buck off with three home delivery chucked in for good measure at any of Uncle Bill's grog shops. Ho, 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 and away you go. John, what effect does that have on... Uh an Australian audience here, yeah, I mean, to, to hear an, an ad like that. Uh... Well, to the majority of Australians, uh, we get a kick out of seeing ourselves slightly exaggerated, but not too much, uh, and sending ourselves up to a degree. Uh, of course, the reaction of, uh, amongst the TV critics, academics and socialites and so forth is one of abject horror, mm -hmm. because they have a tremendous inferiority complex as to the way that we in Australia speak. And unless you've got some sort of pseudo uh, pommy or Yankee accent, uh, therefore you're not a cultured person. Does Uncle Bill, uh, to you, is he representative of the average Australian, that sort of bloke? Yeah. Uh, yeah, see, Paul is uh, he's actually the managing director of a large uh, air conditioning company in Australia. And when we uh, took over this chain of stores, they were called Liquor Supermarkets of Australia, which is eminently forgettable. So the first thing we did was change the name to something you could remember, like Uncle Bill's Sly Grog Shop, for want of a better name. And we thought, well, why don't we find an Uncle Bill? And Paul had to represent to me, having been to thousands of football barbecues, now your average guy sitting around the barbecue with the steaks on, drinking about 100 cans of beer. Yeah. And when you're advertising duck off your buck off beer, it's no good going slow motion through the surf and uh, pretty ladies and so forth and fantasies. You just need someone to tell you you can duck off your buck off as quick as you like. And, uh, Mate, you go to uh, any 10 Australian barbecues, and I'll tell you what, there'll be 100 Uncle Bills there. <laughs> 10 o'clock news on 3AW, reported by John Wynn. Today's high forecast to be 26. Fine, mild, sunny, predicts the Bureau. The Claudia Wright Show.
Australia is the total media society, and radio is more important here than in Britain or even America. A breed of radio personalities like Claudia Wright in Melbourne provide the Ockers with a kind of non-stop confessional. Good morning, go ahead please. Uh, good morning, Claudia. Yes. And the other two gentlemen, sir. And Claire Dobbin. I'd like to talk about the um, Ockerism in regard to the man not having heard the word before. Do you, uh, do you feel that... Um... So I'm married to one. Well, tell us about your husband. Pardon? Tell us about your husband. Is he likely to be listening? <laughs> what respect? Well, you, you defined him before. Now, how, how, describe him within the definition of your description. Well, he's the beer-drinking, um, chauvinistic, for use of a better word, um, Navy singlet type tradesman. Yeah. And uh, do you feel uh, beneath him, or does he treat you as an equal? Oh, heavens no, not as an equal. Nowhere near it. Does he give you the pay packet every week? And uh, he's generous with money, but because that evades the responsibility of paying the bill. I see. Does, it, does he help you with the washing up or the washing or oh, the floor? Oh, no, never. Does he help you with the children? Never. Well, producing them, I presume. <laughs> that was the sum total. In out off and away, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, he just, he just actually believes that women aren't equal. Are you able to do anything about that? Do you talk to him about that at all? Um, no. <laughs> well, I have talked. We've rowed with everything about it, but it, it doesn't get through. His uh, contribution to women's liberation isn't about the stage where he might consider giving us the vote. <laughs> <laughs> I've met a lot of people who seem to follow the identikit, international identikit, uh, of a feminist. I mean, has the women's liberation movement really caught on? In Australia. No. Let's ask Nini and Susie and people think, over there. I don't think it was necessary to catch on yeah. here. We've always considered ourselves equal. We didn't have to sort of go and sort oh, of bash rubbish. No, 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 I believe it. There are so many people who are not liberated, whether they can afford to send their kids to creches and go out and join a potter's group or something like that. But nobody cares, certainly not among our group, about do they want all to the be other liberated? people. Of course they do. They don't. They had a survey about um, people out in the outer suburbs and they had, what leisure did you, how did they spend their leisure time? They didn't have any leisure time. I disagree. I think they're, happy in their, I think they're happy in their lot. They've got to have a whinge, but I really don't think they change it for the world. They don't really want to go out and work. They don't want to change their lifestyle. I think this is the point. It's easy for us to say we're bored with women's lib. <laughs> Because we're in a fortunate position where if we want to go out and do an art course or whatever it is, we can afford to have a babysitter in, you know, and we can, in, we, we can do it. But there are people in this country that can't afford it. And women's lib is important for them. Alas, the common sight of Australia's lady bowlers says much about the myth of rugged individualism. For bowling, with all its relentless gentility, is the most popular sport in Australia. The ladies must not step onto the green if their skirts are a fraction higher than 15 inches from the ground. And I've seen with my own eyes vigilant guardians of these matters whip out a tape measure and inspect a questionable skirt. Nothing disconcerting must occur here, I was told by a lady in charge. She might well have been talking about Australia. The West End pub in Balmain, Sydney. A typical Ocker fortress, where the likes of lady bowlers dare not enter. And some of the customers will do everything short of unzipping their flies to show what fending and blokes they are. I asked the public and Frank Savage if the Barry McKenzie films about the celebrated Earl's Court slob were fair to Ockers. What is true and what is untrue about that? Well, I think that's, that's surely extreme, isn't it? You know, it's, uh, it's been, uh, been made extreme to, to make it a seller. It's a film and you're selling it to the public. And, you know, it's, uh, it's been stretched. Uh, there's the other end of the, uh, the stick where you've got, uh, you know, a very quiet little gentle Australian that uh, doesn't say boo and in the middle is the mass. I think, I think one thing Australia has got, and uh, it always will have, hopefully, is that great middle mass. And I think this is probably sets it aside from most every other country that I've certainly been to. Is that uh, there's, a, there's a bulk of uh, humanity stuck in between the low 10 and the high 10, and that 80% is, uh, is a very good thing. The great middle mass, as Frank Savage calls them, 
are subjected to more media manipulation than would be tolerated in many countries. The Australian media, especially television and advertising, are so contemptuous of their audience that the manipulation is usually obvious and crude. All the way from Buck Off Bill to a remarkable piece of McCarthyite propaganda that went out as a TV commercial in 1974 in an attempt to smear the new Labour government as communist. It says much for Australian society that the smear backfired and in fact helped to re-elect the government. I'm Mrs Hedler. I come originally from Estonia, a Baltic state. I escaped about 30 years ago when the Russians took over my country for the second time. I have lived enough under communist regime, so I left and came to Australia. My husband and I worked very hard, and we did well. Then, about 60 months ago, the Labour Party came to power, and I thought, so, it's still a free country. But now I can see how wrong I was. Today, I can see that the Labour is disguised socialist, but for me, it's disguised communist. Vote against Labour this election. It may be your last chance to win. So what you were saying in that, John, is that Gough Whitlam and his Labour Party are communists. That's pretty strong. Uh, that was Mrs. Edler's opinion. I, well, that's I, what the Arab was saying. I've never disagreed with that. In, in, the, in, a, in so far as the uh, Labour Party has in its platform a stated objective, the socialisation of industry, production, distribution and exchange, in other words, government control and or ownership of all those things. Would you say Gough Whitlam was a communist? No, I wouldn't, because there are laws of libel that pre prevent me saying that. Although they reject obvious extremes in propaganda, most Australians succumb easily to wholesale manipulation by the press. A prime example was the recent vendetta by newspaper proprietor Rupert Murdoch against Prime Minister Gough Whitlam. This is the newsroom of the Melbourne Age, one of the few good major newspapers in Australia. The Australian press, television and radio are largely owned by just three families. Murdoch of Adelaide and Sydney, Fairfax and Packer of Sydney. Media censorship in Australia is insidious, and there's probably more censorship by the press than in any Western country. In politics, for example, the heads of the three families support or oppose national politicians rather like godfathers, although, of course, they would prefer the title of kingmakers. The most powerful godfather was the late Frank Packer, whom I worked for as a reporter and sub-editor. Packer was an ex-boxer, the last of the wild men of Sydney, and it was largely his support for Sir Robert Menzies that kept Menzies in power for so long. Packer, of course, got his knighthood. But the most powerful man in the Australian press is undoubtedly Rupert Murdoch. Before the 1972 election, Murdoch decided that Gough Whitlam of the Labour Party was his man, and he phoned the then Liberal Prime Minister, Billy McMahon, to tell him he was dropping him. But once in office, Whitlam refused to follow the Murdoch line, whatever that was, and he too was dropped. In the election campaign last December, journalists on three of Murdoch's newspapers went on strike because of the way their stories were being rewritten and distorted to show an anti-Whitlam bias. Whitlam was slaughtered at the polls for a number of reasons, but no one doubted that the press in Australia had won again. The Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, had been Whitlam's own choice, partly because, as Whitlam told me, he had the look of Victorian respectability, which some Australians much admire. Whitlam was overthrown in a classically bloodless coup d'etat led by Kerr, who invoked archaic constitutional powers that had never been used. It is said that Fraser, then the opposition leader, engineered the coup by helping to persuade Kerr to use his vice-regal powers to dismiss the Prime Minister. The proclamation which you have just heard read by the Governor-General's official secretary was countersigned Malcolm Fraser. go down in Australian history from Remembrance Day 1975 as Kerr's Kerr. The Governor-General's action shocked many Australians into realising that their country was still a British colony, or rather a banana monarchy, where democracy could be turned on and off at the request of a very powerful and rich establishment. For Malcolm Fraser, 
millionaire landowner, and now suddenly Prime Minister, power had been returned to its rightful owners. It's uh, true enough that there may be reserved powers of the Crown, but they didn't matter because nobody had ever exercised them. Now that they've been exercised, obviously people will want to get rid of them. There is a big surge of support in Australia for Australia to become a republic. I would hope that this doesn't mean that Australia would renounce membership of the Commonwealth or, or dispute the position of the Queen as head of the Commonwealth. But young people and migrants, who constitute a very large percentage of the Australian population, are now more than ever keen to have Australia become a republic. We can't have the situation where a stand-in for the Queen, a viceroy, can do things the Queen herself would never do. When you won in 72, a euphoria swept over a lot of Australians. Do you believe there was any real justification for their feeling that a new age was beginning in Australia? We brought new opportunities for Australians, whatever they did, wherever they lived. Uh, obviously, uh, in areas like education, where we made it possible for people to have a complete tertiary education without paying any fees, where we made it possible for people at last to get hospital treatment uh, without payment, uh, where we made it possible for Australians to share in the development of their resources, to see that these didn't go into foreign hands. Australia did come of age. She got into this century. She showed that she had an identity, that Australians could, in fact, make a contribution instead of just depending on uh, their past uh, or their distant uh, friends and uh, associates. You know, the, those three years that uh, we were in uh, will be a landmark, a watershed in Australian history. The Whitlam years also meant the end of war and of shame and anger for many of us. Australia's young men have usually died fighting somebody else's war. And in Vietnam, they fought their Asian neighbors with whom they had no quarrel until Whitlam told Nixon to go to hell and brought the boys home, perhaps forever. He also forced the French to suspend nuclear testing in the Pacific, and he buried the white Australia policy. In the Australia I remember, able and thinking men either left the country or stumbled about with a mob trying not to appear too clever. Whitlam has paid the price for being too clever. Manly beats Sydney, home of Frank Hardy, Australia's best-selling novelist, and one of its finest radical political writers. Frank, for me, coming back at uh, Australia looks pretty much the same. The same, uh, uh, same beach life, nothing seems to have changed much. Is, is, uh, is this calm a, a right impression or not? Well, <clears throat> there are those who think the great Australian apathy will prevail, as it here, is here today amongst these few people lounging on Manly Beach, which I was doing this morning. Uh, a lot of people don't think it will prevail, and I'm one of those. November the 11th to December the 13th changed something in this country and I don't think there's any way we can go back. That's the day Whitlam was... was yeah, and, when and the coup, the as, as, as is often called here, took place. Yeah. Now, whatever the legalities of that were, yeah. there are perhaps 20 or 25% of the community think it was illegal and were extremely angry. Whitlam told them on the steps of Parliament House on the television, keep your rage up. Well, some of them have. Goff hasn't, but yeah. many others have. And I think that not only will apathy not prevail, but a, a situation that began on November the 11th will now continue with this con confrontation with the unions that Fraser is deliberately bringing about and the dismantling of the welfare state social program. And there are, I would say, roughly 20% of the community is prepared to fight on this. You mentioned 20% of Australians, but uh, what about the rest? Well, how do you think they might react when all well, this begins well, to happen? Well, the middle-class backlash against Whitlam brought Fraser into power, and the appalling thing about November the 11th is this. Had there been an actual army coup yeah. instead of a peaceful coup of the Governor-General and Kerr's Kerr, yeah. um, the middle-class would have supported it. They wouldn't have turned a hair. All they wanted was to get Whitlam out, to get back to prosperity, to get back to tax dodges to the comfort uh, to end inflation curb the unions. Yeah. 
They supported that coup, and in my opinion, the Labor Party as a political force in Australia is finished for at least 10 years. Frank Hardy and those like him will keep their rage up, but it's a melancholy rage. Barely noticed amidst the good ochre life. The surf, the pubs, the oysters, the coldies, the beetroot sandies, the Queen's reassuring face everywhere, and the endless anaesthetic chirping of commercial radio. Time on Fantastic to get up, you know, to 6.41. Don't you really feel like falling through the floor when you get back from lunch? She says... Oh, can't you get garlic for lunch? Well, that was before double mint stick gum from Wrigley. If you're out of work at the moment, this is a great opportunity. You can become an owner-driver with all-purpose messengers. Wrigley six double mine, four one five one. And your Ford dealer is the one. And your Ford dealer with a difference is... You may be worried about the treatment of palms. First, an explanation of the term pom. Pom is derived from pomegranate, a reddish, spotty fruit. Australians regard newly arrived English people as reddish and spotty. And if you're called a pommy bastard or a pommy shithead, you shouldn't be worried, because as Australians will tell you, incessantly and unconvincingly, it's really a term of affection. And you'll notice that there are places called Croydon, Liverpool and Balmoral. And you'll notice that every town clerk seems to have an imperial gong, and the Queen's face is almost everywhere, and the Queen's Viceroy, a Governor-General, has the power to dismiss the elected Prime Minister of Australia, which he did last November, and there are private schools called public schools, just as in England. Indeed, the headmaster of Sydney's Eton, the King's School, put it this way. My chaps, he said, are not like the older generation. They don't worship Britain and royalty. They identify with Prince Charles. Prince Charles? When Prince Charles comes to Australia again, he should savour the devotion of the Returned Soldiers League at Alice Springs. For the mighty RSL are the true keepers of Australia's imperial patriotism, the seekers of reds under its bed, and the consumers of much of its beer. The search for a true Australian identity is difficult, partly because one ingrained image of Australians is that of loyal, tough Anzacs, institutionalised in a military orgy called Anzac Day, our only effective national day. In spite of its lost cause in Vietnam, the RSL remains one of the most powerful forces in Australian life. Even uh, several years ago, uh, here in Australia, the, uh, some powers that be decided to change our national anthem. The RSL in Australia refused to do so. We still kept God Save the Queen. And I think this is some indication as what the RSL means with reference to our realm. Yeah. How do you feel, John? Do you feel that people in this country would still go to Europe to fight for Britain in, in a yeah. war? You no know worries at all there. See, I was unfortunate. I only went into uh, national service in 1956. And I didn't leave Australia, but I would have gone. There'd be no worries about it at any time whatsoever in school. Let me ask Carl. Do you believe the RSL felt the same passion for the war in Vietnam? I think so, John, but to a lesser extent in some re region because they brought in national service again. And there were a lot of young fellows that objected to, to being drafted. Also, there's still a lot of mateship uh, within Australians and, uh, you know, if the mate joins, well, I'm going too, sort of thing. And uh, I think that's why you get such a big... Uh, percentage of uh, the young people who want to go and fight when there's a war on and that sort of thing. Uh, the motto, of course, is that it's always been in my mind uh, all these years. It's the motto of the RSL. You must have eternal vigilance to have freedom. Francisco Boki, Alfred Benavia, Melita Benavia, Delia Bondo, and Heriberto Cabrera. In spite of the RSL, Buck Off Bill and the rest, there is a new Australia on the way, with a different accent, a different outlook, and above all a vitality and an energy that may one day take over from the boredom and scepticism of the Ocker, and perhaps make of this country what the immigrants made of America. Well, you say the word I, and then your own name in form. I. I. Renouncing. All other allegiance. Come on. Swear by Almighty God. Swear by Almighty God. That I'll be faithful. And bear true allegiance. To Her Majesty. 
Elizabeth, Elizabeth II. Elizabeth II. Queen of Australia. Queen of Australia. Her successors. According to law. Well, faithfully observed. Faithfully observed. The laws of Australia. And fulfill my duties. Fulfill my duties. As an Australian citizen. As an Australian citizen. Thank you. You're now all Australians. I remember that the ceremony. And when we reached the point that I had to uh, swear lines to the Queen, Her Majesty the Queen, I said the words, but in my heart, I didn't even regard the Queen as the head of Australia, because I never knew the Queen as the head of uh, any other country than England. So being an Italian migrant, the Queen had nothing to do with me. But if it was, perhaps, for instance, the Queen of Australia, or the King of Australia, I would have swear lines to the Queen or the King of Australia. That was my tissue in my mind at that time and in my heart. Congratulations, Alice Brown. Melita, congratulations. You're now Alice Brown. Thank you very much. Celia, congratulations. You're now Alice Brown. Thank you. Where do you come from? Come from the Philippines. The Philippines, eh? When I I become an Australian citizen. You see, in that particular night, I cry because I have to renounce to everything. My commission, my pension, my friends, and uh, I, I notice also that uh, with a lot of uh, migrants in here, they say, yes, is the time not to sit in two chairs. You see? Therefore, let's, fight, uh, let's face the, 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 the situation, because who are the Australians? The Aboriginals? They are the only ones. The man who wrote Australia's first racial and ethnic discrimination laws is himself of Spanish, Chilean and Irish descent. He was immigration minister under Whitlam and is now community relations commissioner. Mr. Grasby, Australia's had the, the kind of mass immigration that America had around the turn of the century. What, what stage is the Australian melting pot at now? Could you describe it? Well, Australians these days are the newest people in the world because one Australian in three is a product of post-war migration and shortly half the population will be under 25. So if there, those people who were alive in Australia at the time of World War II are now in a minority. So demographically, uh, we have, I suppose, uh, the most uh, vivid revolution in demographic terms of any country outside of Israel. You can see that if you look at the composition of the workforce. Uh, in factory terms, the factory worker, the man at the bench, the blue-collar working class. Six out of ten were born outside Australia. So the new working class is, are the new people, the new wave people who have settled. And if you make comparison, say, with the United States, and I suppose most people around the world think of New York as a very cosmopolitan city, but only 19% of the people of New York were born outside the United States. In Sydney, 25% uh, were born outside Australia. In Melbourne, 30% were born outside Australia. So those cities are far more cosmopolitan than New York City in 1976. This is Sydney. Since I lived here, it's become one of the largest Italian, Greek, Yugoslav, Dutch, German, Polish, Lebanese and Malaysian communities in the world. There are problems, of course, as each group struggles for a place in the heap, or at least for the average wage of £100 a week. But there is little of the agony of the American melting pot and the first generation don't say, as they say in America, I am Greek, or I am Italian. They say often with a pride that confuses the rest of us, I am Australian. One problem wrong with this country is that we imported too many English people to start with, and then too many Europeans, whereas this country it really geographically is located in Asia. We, we, sh we should have been taking Asians for a long, for many years, and it, it, under Whitlam we started to think about taking yes. more, but hang on, no, but if we've been taking them for 20 years, imagine how different this country would be. Now, if you had an integrated European-Asian community here, Australia wouldn't be the mindless, banal society that it is. You've got to be very... trying to preserve the best things of Britain and the best things of America in this place that's so far away from those two countries is ridiculous. The nice thing about being a second-rate country or third-rate is that you can learn by other people's mistakes. I mean, we've learned about things like expressways. You know, you don't want expressways. Basically, they're bad. And so, you know, we don't have to be world leaders 
And so we should, should benefit by the mistakes they've made. Should be in the vanguard, in fact. We don't have to be out the policemen of the world. We don't have to be setting examples for other countries to follow and all that sort of thing. I mean, is, that, you know, is, that, is that automatically say third rate? I don't mean third, third rate. I mean, mean third rung, you know. Yeah, third echelon. Well, what, did you, what do you mean then? You look, Americans' attitude to this country was it's like taking candy away from kids. You know, it used to be the easiest country in the world to rip off. In Japan, you know, the Japanese government insisted on 55% equity. But Australia, no, come on, boys, you know, the full, you know, 18th century approach. Anything is OK. And, you know, the Whitlam yeah, thing the was... because obedient dumbbells were running things. That's yeah, why. The, the Americans laughed at us. Under Whitlam, they had to send a decent ambassador to this country because suddenly, right, suddenly this country had a government that was... It, it ended the world's for... consciousness when Whitlam came to power. For the first time. Sure. Mm. Australia at the moment... Uh, is, is a country that's not that old, not that old, not that big. Uh, we should be a bigger country, uh, but fortunately we haven't been forced into it. Uh, I mean, physically, in, in numbers, we should be a bigger country. And that way, uh, you'll get a bigger mind. The more people you get, the more broad the scope will be of the, of the approach of the people in the country. But this is a pretty good joint. I like Australia. class in Australia is rather subtle and interesting. The, the egalitarianism uh, applies, I suppose, to the middle class. And there, are th there are three groups in the middle class. There's a lower middle class, middle middle class, and upper middle class. Australians don't like to call themselves working class. That has a rather unfortunate overtones, and it's a very pom uh, way of describing people who work most Australians imagine themselves to be middle class. And this is Rose Bay we're in now, which is a, a pretty expensive suburb of Sydney. And you, if you own a house in Rose Bay, then you would be considered, I suppose, upper middle class. You're really, you've reached the top of the tree. But respectability is bought in Australia, and respectability is the ticket into the, the upper middle class. I don't know that. Look at that, 56 and 4. Only in Australia can respectability, your position in society, be won and lost on a gamble. This is Flemington Racecourse in Melbourne, Australia's ascot. Billy Graham once described Melbourne as the most moral city on earth. He overlooked the fact that Melbourne probably has more rackets than the biggest mafia this side of Chicago. <laughs> But Melbourne does have pretensions of being moral. Its anglicised and titled gentlemen, sometimes called dingalings, belong to an Edwardian club and its ladies run functions for the needy, otherwise known as bludgers. Incidentally, the difference between British and Australian dingalings is that in Australia a person of title and wealth is considered an important man, but never a better man. This is Parliament House, Canberra, where politicians nicknamed drones and characters run our banana monarchy. And here I am talking with our new Prime Minister, the millionaire sheep farmer, the Honourable Malcolm Fraser. Do you think the Australian electorate, when they gave you that huge majority, were really voting for the good old days, the good old quiet days before Whitlam? Well, you never go back. You're always moving forward and uh, a country of people, I, I don't think they can really look to the past. A number of the principles that we'd want to apply in relation to people 
uh, a constant uh, in um, the philosophy of my party. But the policies you need to apply those principles uh, as we approach the 1980s are quite different from the policies that were appropriate in the 1950s. There's no going back, the world's changed. Uh, we had the three Whitlam years, and uh, as I would regard it, the scars of that time can't be altered uh, just by looking to the past. One of the first things you did was to restore God Save the Queen and knighthoods. It probably puzzles people in Britain why a young, independent-minded country like Australia should bother with, with such imperial trivia and trappings. Oh, it's not a question of clinging and uh, restored God sa uh, Save the Queen. Now, that's part of the story. We also recognise the need for a, a national song for uh, purely Australian occasions. Uh, when um, Australian athletes win at the Olympic Games, something that is recognised as Australian uh, needs to be played. And we've established uh, uh, procedures which will enable, we hope, uh, something which has the general support of the Australian community to emerge over uh, not too long a time in the future. Uh, Imperial honours will run side by side with Australian honours, and we're working now on the, the approach to that, the way this will operate. Um, a country's past is important to it. You, to cut off everything that's happened, to cut off your traditions, makes no sense at all, because this is one of the things that leads to stability. Alice Springs. I keep coming back to the Alice because I somehow feel it's closer to the soul of Australia, the great wilderness, than the retreating red roofs of Sydney and Melbourne. And the Alice is often a microcosm, here, almost to a man, they voted out the nationalist dream of Whitlam and voted in Fraser, the landowner with an English butler. And in the Alice, as in suburbia, you can watch the newly arrived Greeks and Italians and the tourists cruising up and down the wide streets looking for the centre of life. They never find it, of course. And it's said here that when they finally stop looking and couldn't care less, they've become Australians. And here are some tourists who have come thousands of miles to the very centre of Australia, only to be told the same old lies about the outback and its first inhabitants. Everybody's in a nice fly through, I think, uh, an explanation of the complete myth of the Australian returning boomerang would possibly be in order. Now, there's three types of boomerangs used in central Australia, of which the returning boomerang was never seen until the coming of... European or white man. So if everybody feels fit and active and you've got shares in Kodak, you can go click, give Mr. Kodak 20 cents and we'll show you how to use a boomerang. Everybody get ready to duck. <laughs> oh, you won't get enough come on, rush come to on. worry, so don't you? This is going to be stupid. Fairly hard, snap. No, not hard enough. I told you. Not They're not the easiest things to play with. <laughs> what kind of game did the was the boomerang used to, to hunt when it? Uh, any light bird, but normally over water. Yeah. Because then, if they did hit, they went for both, both their weapon and the bird. But it was very, very rarely used. How possibly, I suppose, ten percent of its life was ever used for that. <laughs> <laughs> Ten percent of its life was ever used, you know, yeah. on that particular. But it area. was was it not used for uh, for hunting kangaroos? No, and no. It wasn't. Too light, even yeah. when they were made by the Aborigines, they were yeah. too light. Now, isn't uh, I mean, how can you possibly aim at a bird to think like that? You can't. This is it. It's got to go over a flock. I see. But if you throw into a flock, occasionally you'll hit you a bird, and that's why it was never used. It wasn't a weapon, really, as such. <laughs> You heard about the Aborigine who went crazy, he bought a new boomerang, went mad to him, throw his other one away. <laughs> when I flew into Alice Springs the other day, the town was cut off by floodwaters. Hundreds of Aboriginal people, the first Australians, were marooned in their squalid camps without food or dry clothing or even a roof over their heads. An appeal was broadcast over Alice Springs radio for food and blankets. And on that day, there were just nine responses. Nine out of a population of 13,000. The Central Australian Aboriginal Congress did a survey recently and found that between 70 and 80 per cent of young Aboriginal children living in the Northern Territory suffered from malnutrition, partial blindness, 
ear and mouth infection, dysentery, and other preventable diseases. That could be a statistic from Africa or India, but it's not. It's from lucky Australia. In the heart of Australia, it's 21 after 5. And due to the recent wet conditions here in the Alice, the Aboriginal Health Centre down in Hartley Street still requires blankets, foodstuffs and children's clothing urgently. Anybody who can help, please take these items to the centre in Hartley Street. So if you have some spare blankets, foodstuffs or children's clothing that you can help out with, please drop them in to the Aboriginal Health Centre in Hartley Street. Unlike South Africa, Australia keeps its secrets well. You don't see camps like these in Sydney. For two days, a child lay in one of them, heaving with bronchitis and without food, while the club members discussed the state of the green. When I wrote about that in a Sydney newspaper, the letters poured in and said I was a liar. Listen, mate, they said, that simply couldn't happen in Australia. This little way I eat, nothing today, we are. Nothing today? No, nothing. No, more, no more, correct? This is damp as hell. Oh, oh, lady's leaving me. Yeah. Well, listen, we'll bring that car back here in a minute to pick us up and take us up there. There's plenty of food uptown, all right, and bring us back again. All right? This is a typical camp around Alice Springs, but this one's right under the nose of the Alice Springs Bowling Club and all the white people, and they see the Aborigines, but they don't see them. They're yeah. there, but they're not there. So the city fathers and businessmen and all those people, they, 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 they belong to that they club. They belong to that club. And not only Alice Springs, but Australian society is bowling over there. And these, some of these kids don't have a fee, haven't had anything to eat for three or four days. Everybody's wet here, and they've had these tents here. And if we didn't give them the tents from the Central Australian Aboriginal Congress, they'd have nothing. They're spoiling the view. They don't want them around the place. Yeah. They want them out of sight and out of mind, you know. Yeah. They don't care where they go, well, where as long they as they go? get out of here. Well, they just got nowhere else to go but down the creek. But they come from the creek. The creek's full of water. The creek's full of water, so what they're going to do is just, they're going to just stay here and just go down to another spare block, you know, get it booted from one block to another. A few Aborigines, like their nationally respected leader, Charlie Perkins, are able to make it. Unlike the indigenous people of South Africa, who are the majority, the Aborigines, of whom there are only a few thousand, have little hope. Overlooking Botany Bay, where the first ockers landed, is this migrant hostel named after Captain Cook's ship. And here lies the new paradox of Australia. Since I left, nothing good has happened to the Aborigines. And yet there's an indefinable hope, almost an excitement here. In these modern caring hostels, a far cry from the old Nissan huts, are no longer faces from the squalor and despair of Britain's slums, but faces from elsewhere. Without crisis, Australia is very slowly beginning to turn brown. And I wonder if the Ockers and the Dingalings are aware of this, or maybe they are. And like good Australians, either they couldn't care less, or they'll just give them a fair go. Well, is Australia something special? Or is it just asleep on the beach and watching old movies on its terrible television? You see, there's always some truth to national myth. And for all their craving for respectability, Australians probably feel equality more than most people's. And for some reason, perhaps even modesty, Australians have never boasted about how they have quietly and skillfully integrated an incredible mosaic of people. Turks, Greeks, Arabs, Jews, Filipinos, Poles and Poms. The exception of the Aborigines, the first Australians, whose treatment you have seen. There's a hidden problem to the lucky country. The empire is dead and the world these days is naughty and nasty. And just as that other European outpost, South Africa, will soon be forced to come to terms with the world around it. So Australia will have to come to terms with its world, Asia, which at the moment most Australians regard as one big duty-free shop on the way to London. My guess is that the days of innocence are drawing to an end for Australia. Maybe not for this generation, but I wonder will a confident and developed Asia accept on equal terms an isolated Australia, still clinging pathetically to God save the Queen and the Queen's top-hatted Viceroy, an Australia owned by foreigners and run by third-rate businessmen and wet nurse by America. But perhaps I'm being much too serious. Ask any Australian what he thinks about the future and he'll utter those magic words, she'll be right, mate. I hope so, mate. People are interested first in themselves, then their family, their neighbours, their street, their suburb, and they've never heard of Timor.
After all, it's the only country in the world where two dear friends and old friends will call each other old bastards. I don't want to be more Australian than Nat Kelly. His contribution to women's liberation hits about the stage where he might consider giving us the vote. I won't say some of my best friends are proms, it sounds ridiculous, but, but they are.